First Peter chapter 4. We will be looking at verses 14 through 16. God has one son on earth who is without sin. But never one son without suffering. We've all suffered. We've all endured through some sort of hardship or reproach or mocking. In fact, in the United States, we seem to be experiencing this um, legal mockery of Christianity. We have seen individuals file lawsuits against Christian corporations like Hobby Lobby because they don't want to support abortion uh, because of the Obamacare and the government is forcing them to pay for those things and they're making a stand and saying that if we do that we'll shut the stores down and they have a lot of stores and so we see some persecution in that manner we see our children who have homework and they bring it home to their parents and they decide that they will write a report about Christ and how Christ is their hero Christ is the person that they look up to and they will write this whole essay, you know, as, as hard as an essay is to write, but they'll take their time and they'll talk about Jesus and write his name on this line paper and then they will hand it in and then the teacher will give it back with an incomplete or an F saying that you can't use the name Jesus, that it's offensive to people and you have to rewrite it or you'll get an F. And so we're seeing this type of persecution taking place. A, a couple out here in Marietta, uh, two doctors who were asked to uh, perform a procedure and they they shared with this person that, that it's not something we do, it's against our faith and it's uh, you know something we don't want to do. And so they were sued and uh, brought to court and they lost and they're losing their business because of it. And they even offered this person to go somewhere else and pay for it, but they wanted to attack their Christian faith. And so we're seeing this throughout the world. Everyone is suffering, it seems, in the world. Uh, we're, we're not as bad as those outside of the United States. You can go to uh, some of these Muslim countries, and they're literally killing Christians. We see Asid, who is in Iran. He's in prison. I heard that uh, he's in the hospital right now, suffering from um, all the injuries of being uh, mistreated there in Iran. And there are many Christian brothers and sisters who are dying for their faith. And so in light of all of that, we will talk today about Christian suffering. And it seems that this chapter is filled heavily with Christian suffering as Peter brings three basic points across to us. One is there's blessed sufferings. There are blessings in sufferings. Two is there's unjustified sufferings. And unjustified means that you're a Christian, but sometimes we do dumb things. And then we get uh, some repercussion. Uh, we reap because we've done those wrong things. And so that's unjustified suffering in that we deserve that suffering because of our stupid mistakes, you know, whatever it is that we do. And then there's also justified sufferings, that because we are Christians and because we stand up for our faith, that we will be persecuted. And that's justified. And it also brings glory to God. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and read those verses, and then we will get into it. Verse 14, Peter says, If you are reproached, now, the word reproach there means insulted or reviled. For the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. On your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. If, if, or yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. Now last week, or the last time we met, we were in verse 13, where Peter talks about Christ's sufferings and how we were partakers of that. He says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now that's how we want to suffer, like Christ suffered, partaking of his suffering, that righteous suffering. In fact, he told us that, that if they reproach him, they'll reproach us. That if they persecute him, they'll persecute us. If they hate him, they will hate us because we are his children. And so what he endured, what he went through, we will also endure and go through. 
Let's look at this first point, the blessed reproaches, the blessed reproaches. He says in verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ. And as I said earlier, reproach means assailed or abused. This is through slander, through mockery, or whether someone heaps a bunch of insults on you to somehow uh, shame you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. The word if really should be when you are reproached. Because as we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we will be reproached by people. Now why are we reproached? Why can't we just get along in this world? Why can't we respect one another's faiths or beliefs? As believers, we should respect other faiths' beliefs. We understand that Christ came, that He died, and that He resurrected. And that He has given us eternal life. We understand that. We believe that because of God's grace and mercy. We understand that if you do not believe that, God says you'll be separated from God for eternity. Uh, It's what He calls hell. If you don't believe in Christianity. We believe that and so we see how important the message is of the gospel. And so we try to share that with as many people as possible because we love them. But we don't push it on them. We don't try to force them. We try to explain to them how much God loves them, that He would send His Son to die on the cross for them so that they could have eternal life. But if they reject it, it doesn't mean that we stop loving them or caring for them. Uh, the hospitals that we have today are all, all started by Christians who love people and wanted to help people, whether they believed in Christ or not. It's just the heart of a Christian to help. And yet, it seems like these religions, these governments, these atheists, have this hatred towards Christianity. And they want to see it gone. They want to see religion gone. Because they don't like it. Because it seems to infringe on their benefits, you know, of freedom and um, so forth. And really, what it comes down to is that they don't know the truth. They don't know the scriptures. They don't know what Jesus really did for them. Oh, they'll tell you, oh yeah, he died on the cross and he made a way to heaven for us. But they really don't know that. They really don't believe that. They don't know Christ personally and they don't have this relationship with God. That it's changed their perspectives. It's changed their life. That they view things differently. And so, what do they do? They do what that which comes naturally. They don't understand it and so they mock it. They ridicule it. They say things like Christianity is written by a bunch of guys that just want to control people. It's just a religion that's trying to make us slaves and follow after their beliefs when we really shouldn't. Christianity is a fairy tale. You know, come on. A big fish swallowing a man, spitting him up on on land. Come on, that's a fairy tale. That doesn't happen. You know, that doesn't happen. Uh, a ark holding thousands and thousands of animals on a boat and in a worldwide flood? Right, sure. That's a fairy tale. Adam and Eve were the first creation. We know that the world has been around for millions and billions and trillions. Pretty soon it'll be quadrillions years before. You know, we know that. Scientific has proven that. Really? I had a guy on, on Facebook uh, talking about uh, some place, uh, tar pits, and he says it's been erupting for five million years. And so I says, really? Were you there? Well, no. <laughs> no. Well, well, do you know anybody that was there? Well, no, you don't. So how do you know it was erupting back then? You really don't know. That's your science? You know, I, I know Jesus died on the cross for us because we have historical evidence. We have secular evidence that Jesus existed, he walked among us, and that the Romans crucified him. We have evidence that crucifixion was a form of punishment back then. We have all the evidence that's there. We have evidence that Jesus said he was God, that he, was, he came in the flesh and that he died for humanity. And if humanity believed in him, they could have eternal life. We have all that evidence But people don't want to hear it. Why? Because they don't want Christianity. It infringes on their benefits. And so they mock us. And they ridicule us. You know who Richard Dawkins is, right? He's a famous atheist. Well, he encourages other atheists to mock and to ridicule Christians. Literally encourages them. You know what we do from the pulpit? In churches across the nation? We encourage people to love atheists. And to share with atheists. You know, and hopefully they will come to know Jesus Christ. There was a gathering of atheists, ten to 30,000, 
gathered together along with agnostics at a national mall in Washington, D.C. last year, March 3rd, 2012. The featured speakers at this rally included David Silverman, who was the president of the American Atheists and actors and comedian Bill Mayer, or Marr, whatever his name is, and also, again, Richard Dawkins. If you ever uh, listen to Bill on his uh, television station, he... He outright mocks Christianity. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't make any excuse for it whatsoever. You can see that he does not like Christians. Well, rather than trashing religion, this is what they wrote. Rather than trashing religion, the, the reason the rally was supposed to be was for a positive experience, to celebrate secular values, to motivate atheists to become more active. That's the whole purpose of having this rally. That's what they said anyway. And yet... Richard Dawkins, in his speech at this event, called on atheists and agnostics to ridicule and to show contempt for the religious and for their doctrine. He called for them to do that. A call out to fight against Christianity. He gave the example of the Roman Catholic Church and how they believed that the bread was the actual body of Christ and how the wine was the blood of Jesus Christ and he mocked it. And so he encouraged the atheists to mock and ridicule religion in public, he said. Even in public. It's interesting because Peter was dealing with the same thing at this time. And he was dealing with Nero who was spreading rumors that Christians were cannibals. Because they were eating the body of Christ through the bread. And they were drinking his blood, you know. And so Nero was spreading that gossip around the community and getting the secular world to hate Christians. The same stuff is still going around today. You kind of see an underlying foundation there by somebody, huh? Satan. You kind of see how he keeps the same message and uses different people to say the same thing. He's always spewing out that poison, you know, against Christianity. I find it interesting. I find it interesting that we have family members that don't like us. You know, we've all experienced that. I've experienced the family members, you know. And they don't come right out and, and, and say something. Well, some do. <laughs> some do. But oftentimes it's like, oh, you're in church today. You know? oh, oh, you go on Mondays too and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. Boy, when do you do anything? You know, and they mock you that way, and it's kind of subtle, you know. Oh, you're a Christian, you give all your money to the church. Yes, I give all of it to the church, really, I do, yeah, all of it. I have nothing at all to even pay my bills. You know, and, and they just kind of mock you, and they ridicule you, and I've experienced that even in, in my own family. You know, there, are, there are times where they, they get so frustrated because you're talking about the Lord, and like, you know what, shut up. I don't want to hear Jesus anymore, you know. Jesus isn't the main thing. And I go, well, in my life, He is the main thing. He's the only thing. And He's my Savior. So our families mock us. And we all deal with that type of mocking here and there periodically. You might be dealing with some of that even now. Peter said that if you're reproach for the name of Christ, he said in the next statement, you're blessed. He said, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. And so when you are reproached, be blessed knowing that the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. Now why is he saying that? James said, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. You mean I have to stay under these trials? The, the picture there is that you're under a trial and you're holding this trial up. Well, stay fast. Hold it up. Keep it going. Peter says you're blessed because you have the spirit of glory and God resting on you. And the picture here is of the Shekinah glory of God in the Old Testament. You remember how they build the tabernacle and God's glory would fill the tabernacle. It was the presence of God in the tabernacle. Or Solomon's temple and God would then rest upon it to signify to the children of Israel, I am in your presence. Well, we... As believers are the temple of God. Peter is saying that the Spirit's glory dwells within us. God Himself dwells within us. And if you know Jesus Christ, and He is your Lord and Savior, and you have given Him your heart, God dwells within you. doesn't mean you're God. It means He dwells in you. He empowers you. He strengthens you through these times of reproaches. That is awesome when you think about it. 
That is awesome. That is supernatural. Really. It is supernatural. And in fact, it is the only way that you can endure hardship. The only way that you can endure the trials in this world is supernaturally by the Spirit of God. Peter is saying that the Spirit of glory, even the Spirit of God, is resting with refreshing power upon the child of God, causing him to live his life which pleases God. Pleases God. See, I can't live this life without God. I can't do it in the flesh. I can't do it in my own strength. It's impossible to do so. Peter says, you're blessed. You're blessed because you have that power. Corey Timboom, she is a a, a famous writer today, well, past now, but she's wrote wrote a few books. She was in the German concentration camps. And she writes about uh, her worries as a little girl. And she understood that the Germans were a great threat. And she felt so weak when she thought about what was happening, and I'm sure that it probably made her sick at what was going on around her. Uh, She didn't know what to do, and so um, she spoke to her father, and her father gave her this illustration. He said to her, when you're going to take a journey on a train, do I give you your ticket three days early or just as you get on the train? And she answered, usually you give it to me when I get on the train. And so God will give you the special strength when you need it. When you're going through a trial. When you're in a situation, at that moment, God will give you that strength. I don't know how it works, but it works. When you call on God and say, God, I'm in a situation right now and I need your strength. And God just gives you the strength because He sees your faithfulness. He sees your love and your sincerity. That He gives you that strength at that very moment. It is God who strengthens us while we're in trials. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be bold while in those trials. I shared with you months ago about witnessing at the um, bus station downtown Riverside and this gentleman coming up saying he had a gun in his in his sweatshirt and he was going to shoot us. And at that moment, the Spirit just gave us this power that we weren't fearful of, of what he had there or whether he could kill us or not. We just started preaching to him. He says, okay, well, if we're going to die, you're going to hear about Jesus then before we die. And we let him have it. And the Lord used that. He gave us boldness. He gave us peace and rest that he was in total control. When people try to make us angry or they laugh at us or they persecute us, just because we're Christians, the Holy Spirit gives us that strength to suffer, to suffer through it, but yet also to love them through it. And and that's different, isn't it? Even to forgive them at times. We can understand their position because we were there at one time. We, We didn't like Christians. I know I didn't. I hated Christians. I thought they were weird. You know, going to church all the time. I remember meeting one guy. He said he was, he was taking vacation to Israel. I'm like, what an idiot. <laughs> Wasting your vacation to go to Israel? What's in Israel? You know, I didn't understand it. Now I understand it. Man, first chance I got, I went to Israel. <laughs> you know, and it's the best place I've ever been on vacation. It was well worth going to. Because every place I stood on, you know, there was biblical history there. And it was amazing. I didn't understand it at that, at that time. You know, I, I, I really didn't. You know, it didn't make any sense. So we have to understand where they're coming from when they persecute us. They don't know Him. They don't understand it. And so we have to have grace and mercy upon them. God will give us strength at that time and boldness. This is what Paul said in Ephesians 3.16. That He would grant to you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man. That was a prayer of Paul. We need to pray for that strength and power when they laugh at us. It was Stephen, Acts chapter 7, 54 through 60. He was full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And they found him guilty for preaching the gospel. And they began to pick up rocks and stone him. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit that he began to proclaim the gospel message and to forgive those who were throwing rocks at him at the same time. And that's the only place that we see God stand off of his throne and receive Stephen as the first martyr into heaven. That's glorious. That is glorious. You know, it was that situation that Paul saw. And I believe that that was the first seed 
that God planted in Paul's life, that he saw this young man, Stephen, stand boldly for the gospel without fear and with peace and yet gently forgiving and loving them in that whole situation. That's power of the Holy Spirit and that's something that we need to seek out. I really think that that's something that church is lacking today. We struggle so much and it's because we're not seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to live our lives, to empower us to be the Christians that we're supposed to be to stand up for righteousness, to, to stand up for what we believe. You know, we get scared. Something could happen at the, at the school, you know, and, and they're telling us now. They're, they're telling your children, you can't wear shirts to say Jesus. You know, you can't go to school with a Bible. And this is all lies, because they can. It's their rights as American citizens to do so, but they'll lie to your kids and your kids will run home and go, I can't wear this. Oh no, well don't make any waves, mijo. Be careful, be nice, you know, we want to make sure you get an education, you know, and we kind of cowardly said give in to it. And that's sad because we shouldn't. We should stand up for our rights. I, I was getting a little upset and I shouldn't be upset, but you know, we were, we're having this outreach at the park for Easter, sunrise service, and I hope you all come, but we put banners uh, along the fences, and, and we thought we were in our rights because the year before we went to the board meeting, we, we presented the situation, we asked permission, they gave it to us, and so you know, we've had three or two sunrise services there, so you know, what's changed? And so we put them up there, well, they took them down. And so then we called up, and uh, yeah, we took them down, you need to go before the board, and I just, I'm like, again? Wait a minute, you, know, you have these little leagues there, and they're putting up their banners all over the place, but as soon as some Christians put their banners up, you take them down? I said, that's not right, that's not fair. And I started to get a little upset, I'm, like, I'm going to sue them. You know, but God says, just wait and hang on. You know, and sure enough, we were able to make contact with uh, one of the ladies that originally was a part of it last year, and she said, I remember that, um, let me look into it, and we'll tr- get them back up there as soon as we, we can. But we need to stand up. You know, boldly. Uh, don't be uh, mad or angry, though. Be gentle like Stefan and lovingly do it and understand that this isn't fair and it isn't right and you are lying. See, your children have a right to write an essay about Jesus. Your children have a right, if they are a valedictorian, to pray, to pray there. And if the school says, you can't pray, yes, I can and I will. Well, then we're not going to allow you to go up there. Then I will get a lawyer and we will fight against the school district because you can't keep me from praying publicly. And you have to make those stands. But we kind of cowardly fall away because we're not calling on the Holy Spirit to empower us, to strengthen us. We give in. And we shouldn't give in. We should be standing up strong, saying this is our God, this is our Savior, and we have rights because what happens is they remove these rights from us. And the only reason that they remove them is because Christians aren't standing up. That's exactly why prayer was taken out of school. Because Christians didn't do anything about it. When the atheists were screaming and yelling that we shouldn't have prayer in school because that should be separation of church and state. Well, that's a lie. But Christians kind of just said, okay, whatever. And now it's no longer a part of school. I can't go on there and pray. That's illegal. But the kids can if they want to. We need to stand up. And so he said, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. Now his next statement is an observation of those mockers who are mocking believers, but also those believers who are mocked. He says on their part, he's blasphemed. So in other words, those who mock Christians are blaspheming. In other words, they're slandering God. They're making false accusations against God. But on our part, as believers and as we stand up, we are what? Glorifying Him. We're glorifying God in our right as believers to stand up boldly through the power of the Holy Spirit for those rights. It was Polycarp of Samaria who was martyred on Saturday, February 23rd, the year of our Lord, 155. The pro council gave him a choice. You either curse the name of Christ or you make a sacrifice unto Caesar. And this is what he said. Eighty years I have served him, that is God, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blasphemy my king who saved me? The proconsul threatened him with burning 
And Polycarp replied, You threaten me with fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched? For you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked and the judgment to come and an everlasting punishment. Boy, did he stand up? He sure did. No, no doubts about that. He stood up. In fact, he even went on to say, What are you waiting for? Come on, do what you will. And so he was burned at the stake as a martyr, but it brought glory to the name of Jesus Christ as he was burnt. He died with a cause. So Peter says in verse 14, he makes it very clear that you are blessed because you've been empowered with God. And when you are reproached, you bring glory to God. Now the second point, unjustified sufferings. Uh, Peter warns Christians who do suffer, but not for Jesus' sake. You know, sometimes, we're, sometimes we, as people, we just make stupid decisions, you know, stupid choices, and then we end up suffering because of those choices, right? And those are justified sufferings. Um, this would be considered that type of suffering. So he says in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Now, Peter is speaking of one or two things here as he makes a list here. He's either speaking to the Christians and he's looking at their past life and saying, look, you were murderers, you were liars, you were thieves, you were evildoers, you were busybodies. Don't do that anymore. Or he's speaking to the Christians saying, look, they're murderers, they're liars, they're evildoers, and they're busybodies. Don't do that. Because then if you suffer, then it's justified. Because you're doing wrong. And the context here of suffering is these reproaches, because that's what Peter is talking about. The murder here that he mentions is homicide, premeditated murder. Now, it's interesting because as I was studying for this, um, I got a call from a lady who uh, was very concerned about birth control. And she felt that she needed to call all kinds of churches and find out uh, what churches are saying because we don't deal with the subject too much in our counseling. And I, I was honest with her, and I says, you know, you're right. I usually do marital counseling, but I never talk about birth control. What, what do you do about that? What kind of birth control do you have? So we were at length talking about that, and we were talking about how some birth controls uh, will literally abort the, the fetus. And I said, that's wrong. That's wrong. That shouldn't happen. And so abortion is premeditated murder. Plant parenthood. Planning your parenthood when you want to plan it. And if you have uh, a child in the womb, then you will abort it because it's, it's not in your plans. You know, and that child is considered a child. It's human in God's eyes. He said, I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb in Psalms. He knew us as an infant. Do you know that since 1973, Roe versus Wade... There have been 53 million children aborted. 53 million. 53 million murders by parents. Since the beginning of abortion, there have been, get this number, 1,330,000,000 aborted babies. That's a lot of babies. That's a lot of babies. Put all the wars together, it doesn't even, even catch up. My question is, God, what are you waiting for? You need to judge us. What we are doing to humanity, to our future, to these little children is barbaric. And you look at some of the forms of abortion, it is barbaric. It is horrific. It's murder. I believe because of the innocence of these children, they're, they're straight in God's presence. I believe that. It goes straight to God and to heaven. So thank God for that. But I also believe that God has forgiveness. It speaks loudly of His grace, doesn't it? That He hasn't judged us yet. And that He is merciful. And I know every time I bring this subject up, someone, someone always comes to me and, and says, I've, I've done that. And I want you to know that there's forgiveness. That God will forgive you. And forget it. If you repent. I encourage you to do so because it is murder. But we know that Paul was a murderer. And we know that God can forgive murder. But understand the severity of it. And become an advocate to fight against it. 
and to not have it. 1.330 billion babies aborted. Yeah, we need to stand up. And it's so interesting because of their pro-choice, it has brought about a lot of suffering, hasn't it? I have read and I know of people who have had abortions, and because of that, they can't have children because it messes up their internal organs. You know, and then talk about the psychological, emotional stress that's on them because of what they've done. You know, yeah, unjustified suffering. Didn't need to happen, but they made a choice to murder. That's what Peter's talking about here. Or even a thief. You know, thief. And it's including any kind of thievery. You know, you, you could be robbing people, you know, with a gun at the store, or the bank, you know, or in their houses. I was, we were talking about the tires out here. I'm like, man, I'm surprised no one's taking those rims out there. They've been out there for a long time. And then Stephen was saying, no, they're chained up pretty good. So he's expecting them to take them, but he chained them up pretty good. You know, that's wrong. And if you get caught stealing, then it's justified that you suffer. You go to jail. You know, and I think we'd all agree. <clears throat> but yet, what about at work? And we all work for a company, and are we taking things from work? You know, are we taking pens and papers and, you know, using the copy machine? And, you know, are we taking erasers and things like that? That's stealing. It's not ours. You know, and we justify that somehow. Wow, but they're a big company. They have a lot. It's still stealing. I remember the Lord convicted me this of a couple, a couple years ago. Uh, when I go to Starbucks... And I would put the Splenda in the coffee, you know. And I'd take a few Splendas, put them in my pocket, you know, for my home. And then I realized in my home I had a little jar and I was putting all the Splenda. It got pretty packed. You know, I mean, that's a good 18 bucks savings, I was thinking, you know. And then one day I was reading the scriptures and realized, wait a minute, you're stealing. You're stealing because you pay for your coffee and you pay for the right to add as much sugar as you need for that cup of coffee, right? Because you can add 10 packs if you want to. But you don't pay to take some straws and some sticks and some sugar and some honey packs and all this stuff, you know, so that when you have your picnic, you know, you can just bring it all out. You know, you don't pay for that. That's stealing. And I was like really convicted. And so I brought them all back, you know, put them, put them there. I've done that. Uh, you know, you go to a place like I've been to Chipotle's and I get double chicken. So they're supposed to charge me double. And I walk out and realize you didn't charge me double. So I come back the next day and I order it again. I go, oh, by the way, I owe you for another double. And they're like, what? Oh, yeah, you didn't charge me. Oh, well, don't worry about it. I go, no, I'm worried about it. Here, take it, you know, because it's stealing. And yet, we don't think about that. Your employer, you're supposed to be working, not playing, not hiding. We used to have guys that were really hiding and not working. So it's just, wouldn't you say it's justified that if they get catch you, Doing these things, that they have a right to fire you? Yes, they do. Oh, but they're a big company, and they have all these other guys do it. Okay, my dad used to always say, monkey see, monkey do. You know, remember that? No, no. You have a responsibility as an individual and to Christ to glorify Him. So thievery, evil doing, that is doing anything bad. What about busybodies in other people's matters? That's interesting. Why did Peter lump this busybody with murderers. The word busybody means gossiping and criticizing others. Criticizing others. Why would you lump it in with murder? Because in reality, when you start criticizing other people and your busybodies telling others about them, aren't you murdering their character? Aren't you murdering who they are? You're basically committing murder. You're, you're spreading lies and rumors about that person. Shouldn't be. Not with Christians. It's interesting that the word means one who sees or watches over, literally an overseer of others. They put themselves in that position. I'm called to watch everybody and to tell everybody what they're doing. You know, no, there's no gift in the Bible uh, with those characteristics at all. Uh, years ago when I first started the church, uh, there was a guy that came up to me and told me, he goes, I'm, I'm here to watch you. God's called me here to watch you. I'm like, Really? Where's that in the Bible? Because I don't find it anywhere. You're not the Holy Spirit, are you? Well, no, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Like, well, then why are you watching me? Why don't you get busy sharing the gospel? Why don't you help me? Why don't you get this ministry going instead of just watching, you know? That's what we should be doing. But we become watchers. 
of one another, and then gossipers, and we're talking about others and so forth, you know. We need to be careful that we don't do that, and that we're not nitpicking, you know, over little things. We need to be careful. If it's doctrine, I understand. We have to stick with doctrine, with truth, you know, not with false teachings. We need to be careful. But if it's style, my style is different than other styles. It doesn't mean it's wrong or right. It's just different. Well, but when we were at this church, we did it this way. Really? Then why did you leave the church? Well, I didn't like that way. Well, now you're here and we do it differently. You don't like our way either? Something's not right with you. And we criticize and we nitpick. That's one thing with ministry I'm really big on is authority. Is that there's authority. And God has, in the Old Testament, said it very clear that we are not to bring accusation against authority unless there is something serious without witnesses and so forth, you know. Um, do not touch the Lord's anointing. Now, as a pastor, I oversee everything. But I respect the fact that a person can be an overseer of a ministry. I don't want to infringe what I think God is telling me about their ministry. That's between them and God. I'm not going to go and tell them, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know, unless it's something corporate and we're all agreeing to it, to look into these various things and see how we can better them. But for me to go over and say, you're not doing this right. Well, what makes you say that? That's their ministry. Let them run it. Sometimes I think they're not doing it right, but hey, let them try it, see what happens. You know, let them make their mistakes. Let them grow through it too. And that's what's more important than anything else. We need to be careful that we're not nitpicking, that we're not overseers of everyone's business. You know, that's what Peter is talking about here. That's what they were doing. That's what the other believers were doing. And when you get people going around doing that, it brings division to the body of Christ. And then they're the ones going, this isn't fair, I'm being persecuted. They don't like me there. Really? You have to ask yourself, why? Are you a busybody? Are you gossiping? Are you spreading rumors? Maybe that's why. You know, instead of coming alongside and saying, how can we reach the people? How can we grow this ministry? And you're too busy, let's look at the people. Let's look at them and see what they're wearing. Maybe they shouldn't be wearing that. Maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that. Be very careful. This is what Paul said. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit. If you're a soldier, you don't go after civilians. You don't go back into the world and like, hey, I'm a soldier now. I'm going to come uh, back to California. I'm going to police the people. No. No, you're a soldier that's supposed to be over here policing this place, protecting and serving. That's what Paul is saying. No, stop nitpicking. Stop searching. Stop overseeing. Just stick with what God's calling you to do. That really is the safest thing to do. Because no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Who enlisted us? Jesus Christ. So let's please him. Okay, last point. Justified suffering. Now those were unjustified sufferings. Justified suffering. He says in verse 16, Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So don't be ashamed. If you're suffering righteously because you are doing the right things, then don't be ashamed about it. Stand up. Proudly is what he's saying here. There's no reason for you to be ashamed of what sufferings you're going through. Now Peter may have been thinking about himself. Obviously as he's writing this, he might have thought about how he denied the Lord three times. Here, here he's talking about how, how bold he is, how proud he is to know Christ, and how he'll die for him, and then all of a sudden you know, he's ashamed of him. He denies him three times. And so he understands that sensation. He understands persecution. Uh, later on, Peter will be imprisoned and then uh, let go because of his faith and his boldness. And then later on down the road, history tells us that Peter was literally crucified upside down. If you look at the bulletin, you'll see a little picture there in color. I put that in years ago, and it's a picture of, G uh, of Peter and he's on a cross, but he's upside down. Tradition tells us, history tells us that, that Peter felt <clears throat> that he deserved to be crucified like Christ, but he didn't deserve to be crucified up, right side up like Christ. He says, I, I'm just, I'm nobody. How can I be compared to Christ? Crucify me upside down if you're going to crucify me. So he didn't even feel worthy enough to be crucified right side up. That's humility. 
That's something the church is, is um, lacking today. You know, we almost feel like we have rights now. You know, well, I'm a, an American citizen. I have rights. You can't speak to me that way. You can't tell me those things, you know. And Peter would have said, I don't deserve to even be here. What am I even doing here? You, know, you deserve, I deserve to be killed, you know, and put to death, you know. That's humility, and that's what's lacking in the church today. And he, he's basically saying that. He talks about uh, the Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11. Paul does. And he talks about their suffering, how they were mocked, they were flogged, they were chained, they were imprisoned, they were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were killed with swords, uh, they would sew them in sheep's clothing, and they would be destituted, uh, mistreated, uh, to whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the desert and mountains and dens and caves. These were believers who were being persecuted righteously because of their faith. And so James says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's yeah, a good thing. So let him glory, Peter says, let, or let him glorify God in this matter. So don't be ashamed, but glorify God. In those situations. And that's a balance, isn't it? P- or Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is the power and the salvation. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. If we seek to glorify God, we will not be ashamed of the gospel. We will glorify Jesus Christ in our sufferings. So let me close. God has one son who's sinless, but he has many sons who are suffering. And I don't know, maybe you're suffering today. And if you are, <clears throat> seek the power of God. Pray for the anointing that God would strengthen you while you're being persecuted by your family or by the school district or anyone else that would try to shame you in your Christianity. And let nobody, let nobody here suffer because we're murderers or because we're thieves or evildoers or because we're self-appointed busybodies in people's business. If you are and you suffer, it's justified. You deserve it. That's what Peter's saying here. But let us suffer as Christ suffered. Let us suffer for the glory of God without shame. Now those who don't know God will suffer. The Bible says that we're sinners and that we all fall short of God's glory and that there's a suffering coming and it's a righteous suffering because you've broken God's commandments. The Bible said that you've lied, that you've stolen, and you've cheated. And those are a few of God's commandments. And if you lie, you are a liar. If you've stolen, you're a thief. And if you hate someone, the Bible says you're a murderer. And if you were to stand before an earthly judge, they would find you what? Guilty. And would that judge let you go because he's a loving judge? No. He would put you in jail because that's what you deserve. And yet the Bible says somebody took your place. Somebody took the consequences of our sin. And that is Jesus Christ. He took our place. He went to the cross for us. And he took our guilt and our shame so that we could have eternal life. And so you have to thank Him for the work that He did for you. And all we have to do is what? Believe in what He's done and give Him our life. And He said, I will clean you. I will remember your sins no more. It will be as though you never murdered, you never lied, you never stole, you never hated anyone. Isn't that awesome that God did all that work? And all we have to do is believe and give Him our life. If you haven't done that yet, then there's a suffering coming for your life. It may be today. It may be as you go home. It may be next week. We don't know. We don't know when it is. So get right with the Lord now before it's too late. It's only between you and God. I only say this because it's the truth. It's the gospel. And God wants to warn us that if you're playing around in this life with sin you will suffer the repercussions because sin leads to death, to death. Let's bow our heads. If there's anyone here that needs their life committed to God, I want you just to raise your hand 
and to drop it real quick. And I want to pray for you. If you're here and you, you know that you've been playing with sin, <clears throat> you've been lying, you've been cheating, you've been stealing, you've been busybodying, you know, the Bible says you're not inherit the kingdom of God. And you need the Lord in your life. So just raise your hand and say, I need Jesus to take my place. I wanted to accept Him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Anybody else? Before I pray, I want to give you that last opportunity. You know who you are. And Jesus knows you. And He knows your heart. Just give your life to the Lord. Father, I want to just lift up uh, this person that lifted their hands, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them and empower them through your spirit, Lord. There's some areas in their life, Lord, that um, they're struggling with, Lord. They're dealing with these situations, Father, and these sins, Lord. And they just need strength, Father. They need help. And they're calling out to you, Father, from on high, Lord. Would you help them? Would you come down and anoint them and fill them divinely with your spirit, Lord? And empower them, Lord, to give up these things for Christ's sake, Lord. To make a conscious choice to say, I don't want to live this way and I will not live this way. And it will cost me something. And I'm willing to pick up that cross and follow Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the grace of God that is upon our lives. And there are many here today, Lord, that, that are experiencing that grace. Father, they're going to walk out those doors. And they know that they haven't given their lives totally over to Christ. But God's grace is still on them. God still loves them. And I pray, Lord, that you bless them this week. And that, Lord, in spite of what they're doing, the sins that they're in, Lord, that your blessings are so convicting to them, Lord, that, Lord, it would change them, Lord. I pray that, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.